Today sees the launch of the Saris H3 Direct Drive Smart Trainer, a few days before Eurobike. The H3 Smart Trainer is an update to the H2, which was an update to the original Hammer released in 2016. This time around, the H3 is more of a step up from the previous version than the H2 was from the original Hammer, with more features and a lower price tag. Today we also see a rebranding of Saris, well more of a consolidation of names. PowerTap's now gone, that's been sold off to SRAM, so that was leaving Saris and Cyclops. Cyclops is now gone, everything is now under the Saris umbrella. Earlier last month I was lucky enough to attend the media product launch in Sondrio in Italy where the company were there supporting their sponsored teams at the Giro Rossa. It was good to see the company there in person behind the teams they support. Straight to the unit specifications here of the H3 Smart Trainer. Direct Drive Interactive Smart Trainer giving you sim mode and erg mode. Bike compatibility is road MTB. All the axles supported, so 130, 135 quick release, through axle 142 and 148 with a native axle with a catch. I'll talk about that later on in the video. Freehub, it's a Shimano SRAM 8 to 11 speed compatible with no cassette supplied. Supported communication protocols, AMP Plus, AMP Plus FEC, Bluetooth Smart FTMS. It transmits power, speed, and cadence. Again, I'll talk about cadence a little later. Power accuracy plus or minus 2% with a spin down calibration needed every now and then, not every ride. Grade simulation up to 20%, max watts 2000, and a flywheel of 20 pounds. That's nine kilos. That is quite a beefy flywheel. One of the updated features on the H3 is that it is silent. Well, very, very quiet. They do claim here 59 decibels at 20 miles per hour, but really what that means in your pain cave is different to mine and somebody else's. So let's just go with it is quiet. The unit requires mains power for all the bells and whistles, but if you were to use it without power, you get a nice power curve that you can switch through the gears and get a decent amount of resistance there for a warm up at a race. The unit weight 21.4 kilos, so taking it to a race is gonna require some muscle and it's firmware upgradable via the app. The bonus round we have is that it comes with a very small riser block and a disc brake spacer included. And it also has some internal cooling technology addressing one of the previous issues of overheating on the H2 and the Hammer units. So the specification summary there, you can see it's a bit more of a step up from the H2 to the H3 than it was from the Hammer to the H2, and it's $200 cheaper. Speaking of prices, here's some history with the Hammer H2 and H3. The original Hammer dropping in 2016 with a price of $1199, the H2 dropping last year, 2018, with a price again of $1199. This year, the H3 drops with a drop in price of $200 to 999. Look, that's an interesting move by Saris, and that really positions the top range trainer in the mid range bracket, which I think should have some positive impact on the rest of the market. Okay, enough of the details, let's get this thing unboxed and put to the test in the Llama Lab. Okay, here's the H3 unit and a kit grid of everything that it comes with. So we have the manuals, the through axle, conversion kits there, the power supply and a little pigtail, the small riser block and some Ruby access. Switching this unit over to through axle because by default it comes with quick release. Okay, now here's the problem with the through axle. I can't actually turn it on to my bike and lock it in. So that's next to useless for me. Solution, the kicker snap through axle conversion kit. It goes through and is installed with a hex key. Happy days.
Okay, over to the Saris app, which has just been released to see if we can connect to the trainer and update the firmware. However, this app is a little buggy at this point in time and it does crash out. So we're waiting for that to be updated. And in the meantime, we'll be using the Ruvi app, which does the same thing. So loading up Ruvi, we click on settings. From here, we can select trainer and sensors, and we can see there it connects to the H3 over Bluetooth. And we can tell that the firmware is up to date. So happy days, firmware is good to go. And we're over to Zwift. Now Zwift will be using Amplus FEC, and bang, there we go, Amplus FEC on the controllable trainer, which then populates the power source and the cadence sensor. Ready to roll, that was pretty straightforward. Now one thing to notice straight away here with the overlays is just a little bit of lag in the cadence and I will be discussing cadence quite a lot in the next few minutes. Okay, so spinning up to speed here on Titans Grove. It's a great little train of warm-up route, this one. And you can hear the sound there. You can pretty much just hear the drivetrain and the changing of gears once I get that sorted. But that is the tick box there. It is a quiet trainer. Not silent, it's pretty quiet. Okay, hanging a left hand turn onto the new Titans Grove course. Alrighty, from here, 10 minutes later, we'll do a spin down. Now I'm gonna use the app, so I've unpaired the controllable trainer. We're loading the Ruvi app to perform the spin down, just to show you what that's about within the supplied app. So again, back to settings. The Saris app will have this functionality soon. This is what we're using for now. Now we click on the trainer, click on calibrate trainer, and then I'm gonna speed this up. But this is what's required. So it spins up to between 18 and 22 miles per hour. It asks you to keep spinning. You stop spinning, it does the spin down. Gives us some calibration tests and we are now good to go. Once we close all this and disconnect the Bluetooth. There we go. Disconnected and we'll go back into Zwift and make sure that is paired as the controllable trainer. Hands control back over Amplus FEC. Happy days, away we go. Okay, you can see that the cadence is still taking a few seconds to spin up to where it needs to be. Alrighty, now, as you can hear, very quiet trainer, which is good. But I'm gonna focus on the cadence here, which is in the blue square, bottom left. Now, as the resistance goes up and down on this new undulating course, the cadence calculation, how the Saris H3 calculates the cadence really falls apart. You can see me spinning there in real time and the cadence going down to 27, 37, 45, 64, it doesn't represent what I'm doing. Next up, Long Leash's Sprint here, so you can see the stability of the unit. No problems at all with this unit. Uh, sticks to the floor. Nice and solid, just over a thousand watts there. The unit hardly moved an inch, so that's all good. It's also part of my data collection test that I'm doing. And again, the cadence after the sprint really drops away and is inaccurate again. But the sprinting itself, I couldn't spin the trainer out, which is a problem I've been having with a number of other trainers, being able to get on top of things way too fast and not being able to put the power down. The limiter today on this unit is me. So there's my overview of the on-bike experience there. So in summary, it's a good ride feel. That flywheel turns over very, very nicely. You can't get ahead of it and trick it in a sprint. You really have to get on top of the gear to spin that thing up and put out some maximum wattage. So that was welcomed. The erg mode resistance changes were smooth both transitioning in and out. Probably one of the best trainers I've tested for those 350 to 450 watt over and unders with the Llama lab test. You'll see the data in a moment, but that was absolutely brilliant the way it transitioned in and out for those erg mode overs and unders. 
The steady state erg mode component of the Llama lab test, which was 10 minutes at 200, 10 minutes at 250, was nice and smooth, but just a little bit jerky on the pedals, just a little bit. Now that comes down to how you ride, your smoothness, your cadence, the gear selected, etc. But look, it was pretty damn good, and I am nitpicking saying it was a little jumpy. We'll see that in the data in a minute. And in sim mode, the hills felt like hills. There's no question about that. And this unit packs a punch. Up to 20% gradient with that big flywheel. You really feel it when the hills kick in. There was no significant uh, delay or lag in resistance change. And I used it for a Zwift race last night. And under pedal, so the actual ride experience, was bloody hard. It was a good trainer to ride for that race. As always, my favorite part of the show, or reviews, jumping over to DC Rainmaker's analysis tool where we can compare multiple power meters to see how things stack up. First of all, standard Llama lab test here with the Asioma Duos. So 10 minutes warm up, we'll just throw that out. That was out of the box. Into the steady state after the spin down and we'll dive in here and have a look at that. Job done, beautiful. As you can see there, just a little jumpy, just a little, and I am nitpicking there, just a little jumpy, but look, 226, 226, slight drop out there, but I call that environmental. But other than that, that's looking pretty good on the pedals there for the steady state stuff. Into the sprints. Now we do know the Hammer and the H2 have a reputation of overshooting the sprints, so I have done a lot of study of how this operates in the sprints. And yeah, it's still there. It's still overshooting the sprints from the Asiomas just a little bit. Not too much. We're not talking 900 watts, as we've seen recently. We're not talking 1,000 watts. We're not sprinting at 2,000 watts. We're looking at probably around 100 watts being too generous there on the H3. So we'll have a look at more of that in a moment. And in the overs and unders, which I've already mentioned, were just brilliant on this unit. And you'll see why right now. That's absolutely the transition in. You can see right here. St stabilizes super quick at 350. Drops straight back down. To it just was nice and smooth. Even in the 450 zones, I was looking forward to the 450s. Usually I dread those if you hit a brick wall at the start of those and have to really crunch over the pedals. But look, that is brilliant. Hands down, one of the best I've done for this section of the Llama lab test. And then into some steady state stuff now in sim mode. And yeah, again, I'm going to have to pull out some, uh, some deeper analysis on this. And look, I call it wattage robbery in sim mode, steady state, uphills on the H3. You can see here, uh, 323 versus 331 on the Asiomas. The H3 seemed to be about eight to 10 watts low, only, only in steady state, sim mode, hill gradients. Yeah, that's pretty much, we'll, we'll go through the data in a moment. Overall though, pretty good, just running along, and the average is 180, 178, not too bad, but it was just those instances I was finding that just separate a little bit. And yes, I am getting a little bit more critical of this. It's 2019, remember? The original Hammond was out in 2016. We need to get these trainers pushed into a better place. Okay, second Llama lab test here, which was the sprints, focusing on those because we know this unit has a reputation of overshooting the sprints. So a number of sprints here, over a thousand watts, let's have a dive into those up against the Asioma Duos. And we can see there, the Asioma Duos is a little bit quicker to respond than on the pedals. Um, overshooting just a little, it's not got a nice curve and you can see the smoothness of it jumping over top there. But again, overshooting by a few watts there in max. Only about 30 though. But you can see that's a little bit more generous, just a little. Second sprint, uh, again, same deal. It's a little delayed and a little bit over. It's, it's smaller, but it's still there. Look, I'll call it there. Uh, shorter sprint there. I think I pulled out nice and fast on that one, but still there. And the final sprint here, again, a little laggy given how and where it measures power on the H3. Probably not too bad if you look at the overall surface area. I guess if you want to have the stats there, not too bad, but still a little tiny bit higher in the sprints. Next up was the Aussie Hump Day Ride, a really good test of this unit in sim mode, just riding along and then putting the hammer down, well, the H3 down right at the end. So 10 minute warm up there, did a spin down and then into the Aussie Hump Day Ride. So the overall power average for the whole ride there, and there wasn't a lot of coasting, 184, 183 against the Asioma Duo. So looking pretty good in the overalls. Let's grab the first little section here. 183, 185, so what, two watts low, looking pretty good there. And then I was looking at the numbers on the screen as I'm riding along last night, and I found a gear that just seemed to match almost one for one with the wattage. So through this middle section here, I left it in the one gear and just try to be nice and smooth on the pedals, no real overshoots. And if we drill in here before I started changing gears again, 180 versus 177, there's a few little overs and unders there, but. Look, that's pretty close given the variability of that ride in the Aussie Hump Day ride. And then I put the hammer down up, well, H3 down, you know what I'm saying, um, up 
the leg snapper they call it. And again, we're looking at 11 watts wattage robbery is what I call it there. And it's consistent as well. It's only in these sim mode gradients that it just drops down. Now, if I recall correctly, the original hammer did this as well. So whether it's the way they choose to verify power, calibrate power, I don't know. But this, look, this is the data is what I'm seeing. So the trend that I was seeing was in sim mode, a bit of wattage robbery there. And then in the last lap, it was on. This is a race lap. We'll drill down hard into here. Overall, 323 versus 325, looking pretty good when the racing really heats up there. So the overall, pretty good. But that edge case, or the two edge cases there, the sprints overshooting just a little, and those sim mode upper hills just being robbed a few watts. And finally, another uh, sprint test today and another hill climb just to check if what I was seeing was correct. Again, after the spin down, after calibrations, after preloading the cassette, and I'm going to all depths trying to make these things work perfectly. But Data is what it is. Overshooting in the sprints. Now I did have a PowerPro MY20 there, the new version from Giant on the bike, um, which we do know reads low because it's a Shimano based power meter. And we can see there in the sprints, the H3 just overshoots them all just a little. Um, and the PowerPro is a little lower, which is kind of what we expected from that type of uh, power meter. More on that in a few weeks. And then to the hill climb, diving in here, and we do expect to see, let's go, go for a guess of 10 watts lower than the Asiomas. And we have Asioma 241, H3, 231. Bingo, there, called it. First time I looked at the data just then, and it's consistent. Um, and we know that the Power Pro, um, which is the Shimano-based power meter, isn't too bad in sim mode, so 240. So, I don't know what's going on with the H3 there. Look, it's pretty close overall, but it's that scenario of sim mode, upper gradient, reading a little lower. Okay, let's get about wrapping this one up. And overall, a really solid unit. Literally, it's a solid unit. It is pretty heavy and bulletproof. The on-bike pushing on the pedals experience was good. The, those erg mode changes for the resistance changes, both in and out of those transitions, and the power accuracy for those was spot on, one of the best that I've used. But it's those sim mode uh, power discrepancies that just, just took the shine off this one just a little bit. And yes, the unit is quiet. I'm not gonna bother pulling out a decibel meter and showing you the different sounds. It's just quiet, that's all you really need to know. The sleeping baby test did pass. Onto a few of my concerns with the unit because nothing is perfect and these are a few areas this unit could improve on. Look, I'd like to see the power accuracy more in line with the Asiomas and the other power meters that I tested against, especially in those sim mode steady state climbs. The sprints, well, look, if 50 to 60 watts in a sprint is of a concern of you for esports or e-racing, you probably should have a power meter on the bike anyway, but it would be nice for those to be just squeezed down a little bit to be more accurate. I'll call a spade a spade with those cadence issues. It's just simply undercooked and it misrepresents what you're doing on the pedals. You saw previously in this video that when I was turning the pedals, it was reporting something entirely different due to the way it calculates cadence. Really, really underdone. And it will cause some support tickets to be raised to Saris or Zwift asking, where's my cadence gone over those hills or those resistance changes? The through axle problem, well, yeah, I visited five bike shops here in town looking for a through axle that I could put in with an Allen key. I couldn't find one. It turned out that, as you saw in the video, I used the one from the Snap Kit. But if Saris can't give us enough clearance space to put our through axles in, they should at least supply the through axles with the unit. And the Saris mobile app, not quite ready for consumption. It keeps crashing. I'd like to see that one polished upon release of this trainer, which was today. So that one's a work in progress. I'll be doing a follow-up video once that is cooked and stable. So there we are, the Saris H3 trainer. Quieter, cheaper, hammer. You can't touch this. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel to support what I'm up to. Thanks for watching. You've got the hiccups. Oh, mum's home. Mum's home, did you hear that? I've been babysitting while trying to record this. Didn't quite work.